I am thankful to be in the house of the Lord this morning with all my friends and family, and uh, we're excited. We're um, in the last chapter of Second Peter, so go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Second Peter chapter three. And uh, if you've missed any of these sermons, go back and listen to First Peter, Second Peter. We've been in this for this is week eight of uh, First and Second Peter, and we've got to hear from a variety of pastors. We've heard from Pastor Kerry, Pastor Jeff, Pastor Brian, Luke, Zach, myself, uh, and I think that this church is pretty blessed to have um, a variety of voices and a variety of pastors. And uh, I'm I'm thankful for that. I'm glad to be a part of that. But two pastors that you probably don't get to know as well are two of our best pastors, and that's our children's pastors. Pastor Courtney, who's over kindergarten through fifth grade, and then Pastor Anna, who is over the early childhood department. And uh, we have an opportunity um, for you to serve in the early childhood. If you are outside in the lobby in the back, there is a Say Yes campaign, and what we're, we're uh, encouraging you to do is say yes to volunteering and serving one time a month in the early childhood department. Why does this matter? Because we are setting foundations in early childhood. The way that you view the world, research shows, is often set in place by age five or six. That's crazy important. And as a parent of a three, a four, and a six-year-old, I have begun to see the benefit and reap the benefit of not just pouring into my children myself and not just having my grandpa Pastor Weaver pouring into my children, but having many of others of you pouring into my kids, and I'm so thankful for that. And so go out, stop by, see Pastor Anna, and say yes. Now, I want to let you know that I'm not up here asking you to do something that I'm not doing. Elizabeth and I serve the first Sunday night of every month in the early childhood. And I know that you'll be blessed as we are every time we get to serve together. If you're a husband and wife, it's something fun that you can do. Husbands, there's oftentimes snacks, right? That's, uh, that's an incentive for me, for sure. Um, kids ask, why do you get two? I said, because I'm the teacher, and that's why, right? <laughs> But uh, sign up, say yes, and stop and see Pastor Anna. And be sure to let both Pastor Courtney and Anna know how much you appreciate them. So you've hopefully made it to Second Peter chapter 3. Let's stand this morning. We're going to read the entire chapter, all 18 verses. You can follow along on the screens or in your Bible. I'll be reading from the New International Version. He says this as he wraps this, these two letters up. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the... um, By God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord... A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat." 
But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Jesus, I pray right now that your spirit would begin to just flow through me. That the word spoke today would um, be anointed and that uh, we would have ears to hear what your spirit is speaking, eyes to see, hearts to understand, and God, whatever uh, you are speaking to us as individuals and also uh, collectively as a church, may we um, respond to that by your spirit, God. Have your way in this service, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. You may find your seats. You probably thought, man, we're never going to get past this chapter. That's a lot of reading, right? <laughs> well, I have to stand and read it, so I was going to make you stand and read it. Multiple times, Peter instructs the church to look forward. So that is the title of my message today. Everybody say, look forward. Look forward to the return of Christ. And it's because we have confidence in Jesus Christ's righteousness and that Jesus has saved us from death, hell, and the grave, we can look forward to the return of Christ. Now, although this sermon talks about looking forward to the return of Christ, and there are some end times, this sermon is not really talking about end times as they relate today. I'm not going to be talking about current events. We're actually going to have a two-week series in September that talk about end times and in times events and the days that we are living in. But today is more so about understanding that the return of Christ is here and it could come anytime. Before I preach, I want to teach just a little bit because it's important to understand in the age that we live in. Right, how many are okay with just a slight teaching moment? And then we'll get to preaching. Is that okay? See, just a couple weeks ago, one of the, the uh, things that I absolutely love about my wife is that she's very intentional with the theology that she's teaching our kids. I've got a three, a four, and a six-year-old. And we'll often read a children's a passage in the Bible and then pull out the real Bible and read the full account with all the details, you know. And uh, Sam and Paisley, Essie, they all ask really good questions, but they just don't understand the age in which we live. And so uh, Elizabeth brought up to the kids, she's like, yeah, Jesus is coming back. And Sam was like, what? What? Jesus is coming back? You know, like how many have seen Elf? And when Buddy is in the department store and the department manager says, hey, Santa's coming to town, kids. And he's like, what, Santa? I know him. You know, Sam, in this moment, I wasn't there, but I can just imagine him being like, Jesus, he's coming back. I know him. You know, he's like, he's like no concept of the age that we live in. Now, much less like six-year-olds don't have much of a concept of time uh, regardless, but they are, understanding um, as, as young kids is that, oh, you, you die and then you meet Jesus. They, they had no idea that Jesus could come back. And so I want to just explain to you all so that we're all reminded and we all know um, the age in which we live. If you look at this graphic on the screen, uh, we see that um, God created at the very beginning creation, and everything was perfect in that creation period. There was no sin, there was no fall. But then Adam and Eve took of the fruit, and they fall, which ushered in the present evil age. Now, if you were a Jew in the time that this was written, you would have believed that when the Messiah or the Christ came, that he was going to bring an end to all evil, to all sin, to all of the depravity and selfish desires, and he was 
was going to bring in this new kingdom of righteousness. But what we know happened is when Christ came in his first coming, he brings in the age to come or the age of the spirit. And now we are here stuck in between these two conflicting ages. We have the present evil age, but we also have the age to come, the age of the spirit. Why is it that you can be in your own house and experience darkness and oppression, but in your same house, you can also experience the presence of God. We live in this warring society of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan, and we, most scholars call it the church age. We are here in this church age. When Christ comes a second time, that is when the Bible refers and talks to about ending the present evil age where all sin will be uh, burned up and that there will be perfect. It will return to the way that God intended it to be. There will be no more sin. There will be no more evil. There will be no more conflict. That is the age to come and that is when Christ's second coming takes place. How many are like, what, right? Hey, this is important theology. Why is this important? Because there are some people that simply don't know. They've never heard. Many people live their lives with zero regard that Jesus could return at any moment. Hear me, church. Every prophecy that needed to be fulfilled before the return of Christ has been fulfilled. There is nothing else that needs to take place before Christ could come back. And when he does return, it's going to be amazing for those who are found in Christ, that have a relationship with him. But for those who deny Christ, it's going to be a very different story. So I don't know about you, but understanding the time in which we live and understanding that Christ could come back at any time, that motivates me to tell others about God's saving love and his grace. It motivates me to bring others into the eternal family of God. The time is now to get right with God, and the time is now to get serious about bringing others to Christ. At the risk of sounding like an old circuit preacher, Jesus is coming back. Are you ready? Are you looking forward to that return? I don't ask that to scare you to Jesus, but it's simply the truth. Jesus could come at any point in time. If you look in your text at verse 10, it says, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Now, last time I checked, thieves don't announce their arrival, right? I've never been in a store and been looking through products or whatever it is, and someone walks in, all right, I'm here. I'm going to steal something. Right? That's not, that's not, you'd be the world's worst thief if you did that. Or you'd, yeah, that, that'd just be dumb, okay? That, that'd be, that'd be sad. That's not the way it works. The time is now to get right with God. So at the close of my message, this is how we're going to end. I'm going to give people opportunity to get right with God if you're not right. And I'm also going to call those who are in a right standing relationship with God to get serious and ask that God would place on our hearts about fulfilling the great commission of going and reaching your neighbors, reaching your family members, reaching your friends, reaching your loved ones, and bringing them to Christ. I can't bear the thought to think that there's anybody that I love that might have to face God's wrath and God's judgment. That eats me up inside. And it should you too. You know, if I were a Texan from Texas, which thank goodness I'm not, right, Dad? I'd put it this way, just to to sum it up. Get right if you ain't right, and if they ain't right, get them right, right? That's today's message, summed up right there. You got it. So I want to ask this question as we look at this text. How can we look forward to the day of judgment or the return of the Lord or the second coming when the Bible talks about things being burned up and the earth being destroyed. That sounds horrible. That sounds terrifying. That sounds like not good. How, how can we even look forward to that? And the answer is simple. It's Jesus. We can look forward to that day because Jesus. Because God loves us, he has created a way for us to be blameless in his sight so that on the day of judgment, 
we can stand with confidence that we will be saved. And as we invite Jesus to be Lord of your life, which means to be ruler or master of your life, the process of becoming holy begins. The Spirit of God begins to purge out the sin and the selfish desires that lie with inside our hearts and in our nature, and slowly we are molded and we are pressed into the way that God wants us to live. The longer we walk with God, the more we will look like God. The more we rely on God's grace, we can have confidence and look forward to the return of Christ. But I think that there are many people who live fearful of the return of the Lord because either one, they are trying to earn their way to heaven and they live in this constant insecurity, uh, insecure state of have I done enough good to outweigh my bad? Have I earned enough of God's favor that he'll love me and save me? And therefore, they're just nervous because they don't understand grace and they don't understand the work of the cross. They don't understand what Jesus has done. And so there's some people that don't look forward to the return of Christ because they're still stuck in that works-based theology. But I believe that there are other people that are saved, and maybe this is you, and you're saved, but you're ignoring the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and you're continuing to live in bondage to sin. I remember uh, the first time that my parents left me at home uh, by myself, and it may have been earlier than this, but I, I really remember, you know, I was about 10 years old. And there's just such a freedom that comes when they don't feel the need to call a babysitter. Like, we trust you to not set the house on fire is essentially the point where it's at, right? And I remember at 10 years old just like thinking, man, I could probably live on myself. All I need is some milk, some cereal, some Swan Man's frozen fish sticks, and a TV remote, you know? And like, I've got this as a, a, a 10 year old. But I remember that freedom, and I also remember abusing that freedom and uh, doing things that I know I wasn't supposed to do. Or maybe I would get into something or be somewhere where I wasn't supposed to be, or I would break something, or whatever it is. And I remember in that time when I knew that I was going to get in trouble and my parents hadn't yet come, it was like purgatory. It was horrible. It was like this constant looming fear of the return of my parents. I wasn't standing there looking forward for dad to come home. I wasn't standing there looking forward for mom to come home because I knew I was in the wrong. I have this suspicion that there are many Christians who are in the wrong and they know it. And instead of picking up their phone and calling your heavenly father and confessing and saying what you've done and asking him to forgive you and to empower you so that you can be free from your sin, instead you're just kind of afraid, just when is he going to come home and how is he going to respond? Can I just remind you of God's faithfulness in his love and his mercy and his grace to us? And when we call and we call on the name of the Lord and we confess with our mouths our sins, he is faithful to forgive us. And oftentimes as a 10-year-old, I would be worried about something that I had done and when mom and dad came home, they met me with mercy and grace and not shipping me to China. You know, like, we're done with you. See ya, right? Loving arms, we'll deal with it. We'll deal with the consequences, but I still love you. Hear me, church. Hear me, Christian. Holy living brings about peaceful living. As you allow the Spirit of God to purify your heart and purify your actions, you will live a more peaceful life. Peter understood this. Verse 11, he says, Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. Verse 14, Peter instructs us to make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. In verse 1, he urges us to wholesome thinking. Evaluate your life in this moment, church. Allow the Spirit of God right here, everybody listening, is the life that you are living leading your heart to be at peace with God? 
And if not, then when are you going to invite the Spirit of God to be a part of the solution and helping you overcome the lifestyle that you are living? God will respond full of mercy, but he also is full of power. And he will enable us to overcome our sin. For some of you, today is the day you get right with God. It's time you get right with God. So we can look forward to the Lord's return because we are covered in the righteousness found in Christ. But why should we look forward to the return of Christ? Why do we look forward to that day? And the reason why is because things will be restored and renewed to the way that they were originally intended to be. There will be an end to the present evil age. Verse 13 says that there will be a new heaven and a new earth where what dwells? Righteousness dwells. My heart longs for a world with no more corruption. My heart longs for a world where there are no longer selfish rulers and politicians, where we can live in peace and harmony and unity and things are restored. My heart longs for a world where there's no longer sickness and disease and famine. My heart longs for a world that that doesn't live in conflict. But you know the sad reality is that most of us can't even comprehend that as being a reality. Why? Because even within your own family, within your own bloodline, you live in discord and disunity. And you're unwilling to be humble and submit to God and go to that person and reconcile the relationships and fix the relationship. And so the thought of having a peaceful world isn't even like a possibility for you because you don't even have a peaceful family. You don't even have a peaceful marriage. I look forward to the day where God's spirit becomes so present and so full, it just leaves no room for selfishness, it leaves no room for discord, it leaves no room for the sins of this world. I look forward to that day. Is anybody else just like, man, just bring me to that moment where Christ is on the throne, where there is no conflict, there is no strife. I'm so looking forward to that day. I, I can imagine that our, our Christian brothers and sisters in Afghan, they're looking forward to that day. Unfortunately, I've heard people talk about the return of Christ and the day of judgment in a gleeful way. I've heard Christians talk about it in a way that like, well, good, they'll finally get what they deserve. We, if, if you really have a concept of God's heart, and, and you really think about it. I don't believe that God ever celebrates the death of anyone who is apart from him. No matter how wicked they are and no matter how much persecution they are causing another individual, they are not, I, I don't believe that God celebrates that. I believe that his heart still hurts. And in the same way that maybe God is, is delighted that his children are no longer persecuted, I believe that his heart breaks that this person never accepted and, and bowed their knee and confessed with their tongue that he is Lord and Savior. We should never celebrate or gloat in the day of judgment so that child molesters or terrorists or murderers or adulterers or this or that, that they just get what they deserve and they just, they had it coming. Right? We all deserve death. We all deserve judgment. And we all deserve the wrath of God. And if it weren't for Jesus and what he did on the cross, we would be right there with him. Let's not look forward to the day in a gleeful way, saying they're going to get what they deserve. But let's look forward to the day when all things are made new. Verse 9 says that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And again, in verse 15, he says that the Lord's patience means salvation. 
God's desire is that all be saved. That's why he's patient in his return. And Peter explains a little bit about this return in verse 8. He reminds us that God operates on a different time system than we do. A day for us is like a thousand years to God. And a thousand years to God is like a day to us. How, how many of you can make sense of that? Not me, right? Like that, that's just difficult. But our God does not exist inside time. He created time. I, I've uh, been able to travel to different cultures for different reasons, whether vacation or mission trips or different things. And, and I, I, how many has ever like traveled to the continent Africa or a country in Africa, right? Okay, um, pretty neat experience and not all African countries, but many just operate on a completely different timeline. Sort of like when my dad preaches, he just operates on a different timeline. Lunch doesn't exist, right? <laughs> My mom's shaking her head, <laughs> right? So in, in these countries, you could say, hey, I'm gonna meet you at the well afternoon. Well, that could mean 12.30 or that could mean four o'clock because both are afternoon. And to them, it's no big deal. It's just like, yes, that's what I have going on that day. It, it just, and there's other cultures. Cor- correct me if I'm wrong. Has anybody else experienced that where it's just like time is just not important in that, okay, I, I don't think everybody's understanding. Um, so, wives in the room, raise your hand, okay? You understand this. Actually, uh, Carly Spencer, will you guys stand up real quick, okay? I'm gonna embarrass you just for a second. These guys are engaged, wonderful people, and uh, I, I don't know who's planning to marry you. Like, I, I don't know if you've got that picked out, if it's gonna be my dad or whoever. Um, but I'm just gonna give you guys a little bit of premarital counseling advice in this moment. And everybody else can listen in. Don't worry, it won't get weird, okay? But um, someday, Carly, you're gonna have a honey-do list. And you're gonna give Spencer that list. And he's gonna say these words. I'll get to it. Okay? Now, I'll get to it could mean that he's going to get to it today, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna happen today. It could mean that it's gonna be tomorrow, or six months, or two years. And Carly, you don't need to remind him every six months of what he told you that he would get to. He's gonna get to it, right? You guys can find your seats. I think that kind of paints the picture that when God says, He's coming back. He is coming back. It might be tomorrow. It might be this afternoon. It might be six months. It might be two years. But he is coming back. Peter alludes to it. I don't have time to, to dig into this. But he talks about the word of God speaking creation into existence. God speaks and things happen. God speaks and order takes place. God speaks and things begin to grow. When God speaks, it will happen. And in the same way, when Jesus speaks, guess what? It's gonna happen. So when he says there will be destruction, when he says there will be a new heaven and new earth, when he says that I am coming back, when he talks about the parables, of the virgins and their lamps and being ready and how he could come back. He means it. God is good on his word. I look forward to that day where there's no more sickness, no more pain, where all things are made new. But it it motivates me because if we're to really take an honest look at those that we have influence over, that we are surrounded, that we have been planted by God in a specific area of influence, there's a lot of people that are gonna be on the wrong side of the day of judgment where they're gonna experience wrath instead of forgiveness and grace. We're gonna end today by praying for people that you know 
that aren't probably right with God. So right now, I believe that God is just gonna be able to be, continue to speak to your hearts, to your minds, and he's gonna put in your mind someone, maybe it's a family member, coworker, someone that you know you're supposed to witness to. Simply tell. Introduce them to Christ. See, I look out, I see some hairs, we won't call them gray, we'll call them silver, or I, I don't know. We, we see some people that are older in this congregation, right? I love that. I love that I get to go to a church with people that are founded, rooted. I'm so thankful for you. I'm so, so, so thankful for you. But just because you had a place of influence at your work and now you're retired doesn't mean that you don't continue to have a place of influence now. Your work is not finished. I, I never wanna get legalistic with, oh, if you haven't led someone to the Lord in the last year, then you're not a Christian. I'm never gonna say that. I'm never gonna say that. But I will say, if you haven't introduced someone to Jesus, you better check where your heart is. Because God's heart should be our heart. And God's heart is that all know him. That's why he's patient in his return. And we get to, as our imperfect people, imperfect Christians, we get to be a part of bringing others to an eternal family. Christ.